Awesome. Well, I'm so excited to have you here. Week one of a brand new series, a brand new series that we're doing simply entitled How to Be Brave. This entire month, we're going to be talking about the subject of bravery. And I thought to myself, I'm like, what can I do to really start this thing out with a bang, to talk about bravery and courage? And so I went to the store and I said, do you have any red pants? (laughs) <laughs> bravery and courage, right? Let that be a picture. Man, we've had an exciting weekend here at the Place Church. Uh, a lot of great things. We had two weddings yesterday, back to back. We did a three, uh, three o'clock wedding right here. April and Richard got married right here. And then after we finished that, we drove up to Kirkland, Kirkland. I didn't even know there was a Kirkland until I found it. I go to this place. There's, there's really nothing. And then I go to this incredible oasis that's just nestled away in Kirkland. And I'm really happy that Michael and Abby were there and they got married up in Kirkland. Now, Michael and Abby, you may not know Michael's here. He's part of our security team, actively engaged. They actually started dating when they started coming to our youth group. So to watch that form to the place where they're taking a stand, hallelujah. We are making a difference, right? And so it was a great day yesterday. We celebrate, we rejoice with those who rejoice. And today we're going to dive into this bravery message. And talking specifically about bravery actually brought me back to my childhood. And one of my favorite movies I remember watching as a youngster growing up, that movie was... The Wizard of Oz, this tale, right, of these four individuals. You had Dorothy with her little dog, Toto. And, uh, and then you had these three other characters. And everybody's searching for something. What was Dorothy searching for? Home, right? And then you had the Tin Man. What was the Tin Man searching for? A heart, right? Then you had the Scarecrow. What was he searching for? Exactly. Not courage, actually. The scarecrow was for brain, but the lion was searching for courage, right? I remember the first scene when I see the lion known as the cowardly lion. He comes out, and as soon as he meets them, he's coming in, and he's tough and rough, and he's coming in to intimidate and to be strong because that's what lions do, and he begins to yell at the dog, Toto, and out of nowhere, Dorothy comes down, whatcha, smacks him right on his nose, right? And he starts crying, and it comes out that this fearless lion. Wasn't very fearless. In fact, he had a whole lot of fear within him. He was not courageous. He was cowardly. You know, he sings a song where one of the lyrics in the song was, I'm afraid there's no denying. I'm just a dandelion. (laughs) You know, and I think about that and I think about many of our lives. I think about maybe the place where we are, where we read the scripture, and we know that we are supposed to be strong and victorious, that we know that we are supposed to do great and mighty exploits, but maybe there's times and there's seasons where we don't feel very strong and victorious, where we don't feel very mighty, we don't feel very victorious, and maybe for ourselves, even like the cowardly lion, that we're going through this life of faith in this place of fear, not in a place of courage, not in a place of bravery, but in a place of fear. And I think we have to start from this place really understanding what bravery is. Like, how would you describe bravery if you were to define bravery? Some of you guys are like, man, I didn't know I had to talk in this church. What's up with that, you know? Fearless, without fear. What else? To take chances. To be brave is to take chances. Good. What else? Courageous, good. To be brave is to be courageous. All those are great answers. I I love the definition I found of this thing called bravery. Bravery was the quality or state of having or showing mental or moral strength to face danger, to face fear, to face difficulty. And the interesting thing for me is that I noticed when I read that definition that in order to be brave, in order to operate according to bravery, there has to be fear that's there. 
Like you have to be able to face that fear. In fact, I heard this quote that said this, to be brave is when you're afraid, but you do it anyways. To have that fear, because I think sometimes in life, when we experience fear, we think that we're not brave. When we experience difficulty or desire to run away, we feel like we don't have courage, but we have to have that fear. Let me tell you, if you're just staying in your little comfort zone, not doing anything out of your comfort zone, doing everything that you're able to do all on your own, right, with your own ideas, with your own thoughts, with your own money, with your own strength, then you don't even need bravery. You don't even need courage. You can just operate right in this place. It's not until you begin to get out of that comfort zone that God really begins to move and you begin to face those things you fear and bravery and courage begins to rise inside of your life. And let me tell you, there's lots of things, lots of things in this world that you can fear that you can be afraid of. In fact, they got names for almost all of them, right? I think about this one here, ornithophobia. Do you guys know what ornithophobia is? A fear of? Exactly right, my friends, a fear of birds, right? That's my, my wife actually struggles from ornithrophobia, yeah, but that is not her baby picture. All right, so uh, what about this one? What about this one here? Uh, nyctophobia. Any ideas on this one? Nyctophobia? Scared of nicotine. No, <laughs> but that's a worthy fear, right? It's actually the fear of the dark, being scared of the dark. Growing up, maybe some of you guys were nyctophobic, right? Scared uh, when it got dark in your room or dark in your house. And then there's this one. I know that each and every single one of us know one of these people, ergophobia. In fact, for some of you, you got one of these living in your basement. Ergophobia, a fear of spiders, food. No, it's actually a fear of work. You guys know an ergophobic person, right? Someone who's fearing work. And there's more fears that are continually coming. Maybe you haven't heard of this one, but nomophobia. Nomophobia is actually the fear from being out of a phone's range of service. Over 50% of cell phone users are nomophobic. You know, some of you guys are worried right here checking. You're like, oh, this is Wickenburg. Do I have service? Yeah. What about this one? Spectrophobia. Spectrophobia is the fear of mirrors and one's own reflection. I thought that was just the morning thing, right? You get up, whoa, geez, is that me? Yeah. <laughs> or finally, this one here, a blutophobia. That's actually a fear of cleaning, washing, and bathing. I pray that your neighbor this morning does not have a blutophobia, because that's not going to be well for any of us, right? Fears, there's all kinds of fears. And the interesting thing for me is as I read scripture, as I read the Bible, I see God consistently bringing his children to a place where they're going to experience fear, right? I think about a time when the Israelites came out of Egypt. They had been slaves for quite some time inside of Egypt, and they had come out. There was a promise that God was going to bring them to the promised land. And they came to the place where they were actually able to see the promised land. They were actually to come into view of it, but they wanted to know a little bit more about it. So they decided that they were going to bring together some spies. And they were going to send these spies into the promised land to check it out. And so they go and they begin to call different people from different tribes that are going to come and they're going to be these spies, right? One of these individuals was a person by the name of Hosea. Hosea. He was called out. He was going to become one of the spies. As he comes forward, Moses looks at him and says, I'm going to call you Joshua. And his name is Joshua, the Joshua that we know from the Bible today. And so Joshua steps up in the midst of this moment. He's going to become one of the spies that's going to go into this promised land. Now, this was a scary thing because the promised land was very intimidating. In fact, there was a very good chance that the spies, if they were caught, were going to be murdered. They were going to be killed. And so they had to know that going in, that there's a chance they're heading into this mission, but they may not make it out alive. 
Now, maybe when Joshua was called forth, I don't know what he looked like on the outside. Maybe he rose up to the occasion. Maybe he said, spy, sure, no problem. I can't wait. Maybe he had this air of confidence. But maybe there's a chance that below the surface, Joshua experienced a little bit of fear. This fear that this may be my last mission. This fear that I may be caught. This fear that I may not make it out alive. Maybe he experienced that, but he came to this place where he decides that he is going to go, that he is going to face that fear, and they, these spies go into the promised land. Now, as they go into the promised land, there's lots of good things that they see. In fact, they come across this fruit, the fruit that was in the promised land, and they said, man, we're going to take some of that home, but it was so big, they had to get a stick and carry it home. There were lots of good things that were seen when they were there in the midst of the promised land, and so when they came back, they had to give a report to the Israelites of what they saw. Now, we see that report in Numbers chapter 13. And here's what happens. Numbers 13, verse 27. The spies came back and they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. So they, they come in and say, here's the fruit. Here it is. It's great. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, mind you, they've been in the desert for some time now. Now there was this land that was fruitful. Now there was this land flowing with milk and honey. There's this excitement. There's this realization that there's a good thing there. This is a good thing. And I want you to know that sometimes in our life, it's the exact same thing. Like when we first start following after Jesus and we find out that God has a good plan for us, that God has prepared, that he has a hope and a future for us, that he's reaching into the midst of our darkness, he's reaching into the midst of that dark place and bringing us out. That is a good thing. However, in this story, we hear it's a land flowing with milk and honey. We hear the fruit there is really good, but then comes the next word, and that next word is however. And that however switched everything. Have, have you ever had that? You go in, uh, you know, to have a meeting with your boss. They're doing your job review. It starts out really, really positive. And then there's the however. I think you're doing really great. Yeah, you come in dressed up. You come in on time. However, we're having layoffs and you're fired. You ever had something like that happen, you know? That, however, like, it, it changes everything. And, and that's what happened here because these spies say, hey, the land is great. This is awesome. The fruit is amazing. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. And the cities are fortified. And the cities are very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Now, you may not know what that means, but what that means is there's, there's giants in the land. This is a difficult place. I mean, these people are vicious. These people are hard, and we're going to go in there, and we're going to get destroyed. These people are going to wipe the floor with us, right? I mean, you, you're looking at this scene, and the, the cities are fortified. The people are tough. They're warriors. They're giants. There's no way that we're gonna, ever going to make it. And so this, however, in their hearts, turned that good thing and transformed it into fear. Have you ever had that happen in your life? You got this really good thing, this good vision, but then there's this however and it brings up fear into your life. And when fear begins to make its home inside of us, it begins to affect us. In fact, when we begin to fear, it's hard to steer the vehicle of our life. I mean, we could be going just fine, just moving in the right direction, and then when that fear begins to whisper our name, before we know it, we find ourselves veering off the road. You know, they say that with race car drivers. As race car drivers are going around, they have to keep their focus on exactly where they want to go because if they change their focus, it actually will change the direction and they're going at such a speed. Boom, that's how a crash is caused. Probably in the midst of this place right here, there's some that have crashed their lives. 
There's some that have allowed fear or something else to take their attention and just turn that wheel ever so slightly, boom, they're crashing into the sidewall of life. And so now they look around and they find themselves where at one time they're heading down the path. God has a great plan. It's going to be good. It's all going to work out. Boom, boom. And you're going down that thing. You get distracted. Oh, there's giants there. Boom. And you crash. See, when fear rises up, it's hard to steer. And in our lives, that's really important because you need to understand and know that God has a bigger story for you. God has a great plan for your life. He has a bigger story than you can ever imagine. And God has the ability to use everything that you've ever experienced in the narration of the story of your life, what God is creating and what God is doing. Those good moments, those mountaintop moments, the moments when you hit that ball out of the park and those moments when you fell flat on your face, those moments you wish you could go back and get back somehow those mistakes you made or the things you did. See, God has the ability to use all of that stuff and he uses all of it for his glory. But the reality is, is that fear is gonna come when we embrace the bigger story. I mean, just, just think about it. If God is calling you to something greater and bigger, that's a scary thing. Think about a moment in your life when you started following after God with your whole heart. God, I'm all in. I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to follow after you. And then something happens that makes you scared. Sometimes when that happens, you know what we do? We revert right back to that place of safety. All right, I want to get right back into that box where I know I'm in total control, where I can control this thing all on my own right? Or sometimes we keep going and then we fall flat on our face and then we just stay there. Some of us have crashed the car. In fact, some of you right today, you're sitting, cars are passing you by and you're sitting with your smashed up vehicle of a life right there on the side of the road. You've just given up. You're like, man, I messed up too bad this time. There ain't no coming back from this place that I find myself in. You know, I remember hearing this Japanese proverb. It really spoke to me. It said this. It said, fall seven times, rise eight. You know, in the Bible, there's actually a proverb. It said, the righteous man falls seven times, but rises again. You know, I love that picture. I love that idea of what I see, because if I define failure according to myself, I believe failure is in the fall. I believe failure is in the crash. Failure is that time when I made a mistake and there's no going back and I wish I could go back, but I can't go back. And so I just find myself sitting there. But that proverb tells me that failure is not in the falling. What is failure in? The not getting back up. You see, as long as we get back up, as long as we continue on that journey, as long as we continue moving, there's not failure there. Yeah, there's bumps, there's bruises, there's scrapes, and there may even be scars, but guess what? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? I love saying that. It was like a Kanye, Carrie Underwood, Nietzsche quote, all wrapped up in one, right? I mean, but think about it in your life. I don't know about you, but that's, I'm living proof of that. What didn't kill me made me stronger. What didn't kill you made you stronger. You're wiser because some of the mistakes you made and some of the things that you've fallen through, some of the things that you've done. You're able to speak to people that I can't speak to because of how big your mistakes were compared to mine. But you're not comparing mistakes because my mistakes were pretty big too. So I got a whole nother group of people that I'm able to reach out to because, but in order to do that, in order to allow God to move in my life and to have his way, guess what I have to do? Get back up. And some of you right here, you've been sitting on the sidelines for too long. In fact, it's a miracle that you're even here. Like it's, it's not by chance. Maybe you woke up this morning with this desire, but then you're like, you know what? I rained in Wickenburg yesterday. I think I'll skip church. Yeah, I'll just stay home and watch online. Though we do appreciate our online viewers. Thank you so much. You know, we, we, but you didn't. You walked through that front door. You came here today, and maybe you came here just for the message that simply says, get back up. God ain't done with you yet. God still got something to do inside of your life. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. Quit licking your wounds. Quit staying on the ground. Get back up and start walking. I think about Peter in scripture. One of my favorite stories about scripture, he's sitting in a boat. He sees a miracle. Jesus walking towards the boat. He looks and says, come on out, Peter. The water's great. Peter's like, that's that's not 
actually what he said. Okay, so I don't want any emails this week, all right? That's my version of what he said. But, you know, Peter looks, he says, you know what? Yes, I'm going to do this, you know? He looks out at Jesus. He's moonwalking on the water. He's like, man, I want part of that. Jesus also didn't moonwalk, all right? I'm just saying, he was walking on the water. Peter says, I'm down. He throws his legs over. He starts walking, and he starts walking on water. And there's this moment, he's like, holy smokes, I'm walking on water. Like, I'm doing the impossible. This is awesome. And then what happens? He loses his focus. He starts looking at the wind. He starts looking at the storm. He starts looking at his situation, and he sinks under the water. You know, and if the story ended there, that would have been sad. And Peter died in the water. (laughs) The end, right? But the beautiful thing, that's not the end. See, what happens next is that Jesus reaches out and saves Peter from drowning in the water. And that's, that's for your life, too. you got to get that. you got to hear that. Because the fear of going under the water has stopped you from following after Jesus. But here's the promise I want to make you today. That, yes, you may start walking. You may start doing these great things. And you may get distracted. You may lose focus. You may go under the water. But the promise I'm going to give you today is Jesus is going to rescue you. Jesus is going to help you learn from that. And when it's all said and done, when you get back on shore, you're going to have one heck of a story to tell. And I believe when I hear that story, any of those disciples could have walked on water. Peter's just the one crazy enough to do it. And I'm looking for some people in here that are just crazy enough to do it. Just crazy enough to follow after God. Just crazy enough to trust God. Just crazy enough to say, I don't know how this is ever going to happen, but God, I'm going to follow you 100%. I'm going to give you everything that I have. Even though I fall in the past, I'm going to get back up today and I'm going to start following after you. I'm going to start running after you. See, it's all about perspective. How are you seeing things? And when you do this, the promise I want to make you is fear is going to come. And you have to decide in your life, how are you going to react? What are you going to do when you go under the water? What are you going to do when you start to hear about the giants in the land, the difficulties you're going to face? What are you going to do when people start bringing up your past and trying to pull you back to that place? How are you going to react? You have to decide already what you're going to do. Now, let's get back to the story. The spies go in. They come back. The one person's like, you know what? It was really scary. It was, great. it was really great land. However, there's giants there and fortified city. And the reaction of the people is wild. The people get so scared, they actually make statements like this. Oh, man, I wish I was still in Egypt. I wish I was still a slave. It would have been better for us to die in Egypt as slaves, to allow our children to become slaves and our grandchildren become slaves and our great-grandchildren and to live in slavery the rest of our lives. That would have been easier for us to do than to face these fears that we're about to face right now. That was their reaction. That's what they decided to say. Josh was like, what the heck, right? Joshua steps in and he says this. He looks at him. Joshua, the son of Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephaniah, uh, who were among those who had spied out the land, they tore their clothes. So he got, he take, which we're like, what's up with that? Why is he tearing his clothes? That was actually a sign of like, what the heck? right? It's a sign of repentance. Like I'm turning back towards God. This is ridiculous. You guys are so dumb. You know, I don't know if that's true, but it just came out. You know, just let me get get by with that one. He just ripped it, right? Repentance. Let's turn back to God. I mean, this is radical. And then he speaks and he says this. He said, the land which we pass through to spy it out. It is an exceedingly good land. Now here's what you wanna, wanna see. It's the exact same thing that the spies before him said. Oh, it's great, it's awesome. It, there is some land flowing of milk and honey. It's a beautiful place, except the difference is the second part that you're gonna hear out of the mouth of Joshua. Listen to what he says. He says, if the Lord delights in us, 
He will bring us into this land and he will give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey only. Do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. So do not fear them. Do you see the different perspective? See, some of the Israelites could only view their problem could only view the difficulty in front of them. And that brought fear and that fear paralyzed them and stopped them and and kind of put them on the side of the road. Joshua didn't just look at his problem. What's Joshua looking at? His God. You see that different perspective? He's like, God has the power to do this. He can take care of this. And on top of that, look at what he's brought us out of. Look at the miracles that happened back in Egypt. Look at how far we've come. Look at what God has done already. Surely God's taken his hand off of them and placed it upon us. So why do we fear the way that we do? For some of us in our life, we have to remind ourselves of what God brought us through already. We got to remind ourselves of how God has always been faithful but for the grace and the love and the forgiveness of God that I wouldn't be here today. You can't forget what he's already done. Don't grow numb to the reality that God has already done miracles inside of your life. Remind yourself of those miracles. Never forget them. And then I just said something that makes absolutely no sense unless you stop and you think about it, and it's in scripture. You heard it, and many of us didn't even think twice about it. I'm going to highlight it, and I want you to think of it in a different perspective this morning. Joshua said this. He said, do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Think about that. Do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. We hear that. What is What does that mean? Well, what Josh was saying in the midst of the moment is that which we're worried is going to destroy us is actually the sustenance that's going to keep us strong. That which we think is going to take us down is actually that thing that's going to empower us and allow us to grow stronger and do all that God is calling us to in this promised land that he's already given us. Imagine if we had that kind of attitude towards the things that you're fearing today. Think about it. Whatever that thing is you're fearing, that thing that's paralyzing you, that thing that's stopping you, what if you flipped it on its head and said, you know what, that's the thing that's going to empower me. That's the thing that's going to strengthen me. That's, that's going to make me rise in the morning to fight even harder, pray even more, to, to trust God even more, to, to take that bigger step for God. Instead of holding me back, it's going to propel me forward. How would your life look different if you had that kind of attitude? And that attitude started with a perspective. The perspective of the Israelites, some of them, was to focus on the problem, to focus on the worry, to focus on how things weren't going together. And that brought fear, and that fear brought paralysis. Josh instead said, you know what? I see the same thing you see, except you're missing a big part of the equation. My God's big enough to take care of this. Our God is big enough to take care of this. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what your fear is. I don't know what has shipwrecked you on the side of life. I don't know what stopped you when one time you had such passion for Jesus. I don't know how you got numb. I don't know if it's the cares of this world, the money, the the life that has just come in, that has just kind of numbed you into this existence. But God's looking at you saying, come on, man. Come on, woe man. I've I've called you to so much more. I got a big plan for your life. I need you to get off that boat. I need you to start stepping. I need you to start following me. And we're going to get there. We're going to get there one step at a time. But it's going to begin, and it's going to start in a place of surrender. Are you there? Are you ready to surrender it all over to God, saying, God, I'm all yours. I'm all in. Take my life and do something with it. I believe that you have a plan for my life. I don't know how I'm going to get there. I don't know how I'm going to make it happen, but I'm just going to trust you till we get there because I believe that you're a good God. I believe that you have a good plan, and I believe that if I'm in your hands, there's nowhere else that I'd rather be. That's the choice, my prayer, for each and every single one of you world changers to do. See, God brought you here because you're a world changer. I've been praying for you for years. I've been praying for the world changers that God would bring to the place church, that I would see their lives. And I'm beginning to see it, right? You see Donna stepping out. She had to get out of her comfort zone. She sacrificed her entire vacation. She's not here so I can talk about her, right? Sacrificed her entire vacation, three-month vacation with her husband. She says, no, the Holy Spirit's calling me to Streetlight USA 
to reach out to a bunch of 11 to 17 year olds who have been stuck in sex trafficking for too long. And I'm gonna give of my expertise and my skills and my gifts and I'm gonna give to them. And she planted a seed that is growing and blooming and blossoming. But I want you to know it didn't come without a cost. It didn't come without her having to face some of the fears that she had, maybe fears of inadequacy, maybe fears of not knowing what to do. And the same thing is true for you. When God is gonna call you out, it's bigger than you can ever imagine. But you have to have the courage to say yes. And here's the promise. If you'll say yes to him, he's always gonna say yes to you. He's gonna give you what you need. He's gonna reach down and save you when you fall flat on your face. He's gonna pull you up. But it starts in that place where you say, yes, Jesus, I'm all in my life is yours. Let's pray. Will you bow your heads with me? Hallelujah, Father. Man, you're so awesome. I just love scripture and the stories of old. I I just love how they speak even to our lives today and how you brought these Israelites to this super scary place. And in the same way that you're bringing your children here today, many of them, to a super scary place to begin to build a life that is radically different from the life that they once knew, radically different from the life that they had. And you're calling them to surrender, to give it all over to you. And God, I just pray for their hearts, for their spirits, for their lives right now. For some of you, the Lord's been whispering while you're here, been pointing out different areas of your life. I want to encourage you to surrender those areas to God, to give those areas over to him. Say, God, I'm all yours. My life, my future, my tomorrows, they're all yours. And there's others that, you know, hear about this Jesus message and you hear about this new way of living, this surrendering your entire life over to him. And it's, it's a new concept. It's a new idea. But you're hearing it, and there's something that's just bearing witness in your heart. There's something that's exploding on the inside of you. And say, this is how I want to live my life. I've been living my life. I've been getting by. I've been punching the clock of life. But there's no satisfaction. I'm not satisfied with the life that I have. I I don't feel like I'm making a difference. I don't feel, I feel like there's something more. And I don't know what that is. I want you to know there is. There's a God-shaped hole inside of each of us. The only thing that can fill it is Jesus. And he's here today with his arms open wide saying, come follow me. And if you're here today and you say, I'm ready, Jesus, I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to give it all over to you. Here's what I want you to do. I want to say a prayer with you right where you are, right in your seat. And on the count of three, here's what I want you to do. On the count of three, I want you to lift your hand up. And I just want you to picture in your mind Jesus reaching down to you and you reaching up. And as you lift your hand up, you're just grabbing a hold of the hand of Jesus. You're connecting with him saying, God, I'm all in from this moment on. I'm all yours. So if that's you, you say you want to say yes to Jesus. On the count of three, I want you to lift your hand up. Ready? One, two, three. Lift your hand up. I see you. 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 I see you in the back, hands all over this place, saying yes to Jesus. Saying, Jesus, we're all in. Jesus, it's all about you. And if you lifted up your hand, I want to pray a prayer with you right now. If you're here and you're already surrendered to Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with those that are praying it for the very first time. Say it loud enough to hear yourself speak. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my past, for my sin, for my mistakes, but today, I turn to you and I run to you and I ask you to fill me with your love, with your grace, with your forgiveness. Jesus, I believe that you lived, that you died, and that you rose again, and that you have a plan for my life. Help me see me through your eyes. Now, let me pray for you. Father, I pray for each and every single person that prayed that prayer today. God, I ask that you empower them, strengthen them, that you let them know that they're not alone. You let them know that you brought them to this place, to this moment right now to hear this good news, this gospel message of love, grace, and forgiveness of relationship and togetherness. And I just pray that there's a shift inside of their lives. I pray for those dark places that you shed light. I pray, Lord, for the bitterness, Lord, that it just begins to melt with love. I pray for those who are filled with hatred or sadness, Lord, that your joy penetrates that area of their life. 
And more than anything, I pray for each and every single one of these world changers to rise up, to rise up and follow you, to be fearless. Yes, they face fear, but your courage, your bravery is going to rise up in their lives and allow them to make a significant impact on this earth. I pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen. Will you give your hand for all those today that prayed that prayer? Now, if you prayed that prayer, we want to jumpstart your journey with Jesus. we got a special book. It's called New Beginnings. We're going to pull out a bunch extra because I know a lot of people today prayed that prayer for the first time. We want to get that into your hands. And so when you go in the back, someone's going to be there handing those out. Take those. You're going to take that home, and you're going to start working through it. There's questions. There's fill-ins. You can do it. If you want someone to do it with you, just call, call the church office. We're willing to do that. But start growing in your faith. Start growing in your relationship with God.